uh, talking about something which is very passionate to me that is linking uh, between SDG and humanitarian action or perhaps humanitarian inaction at the same time. Uh, let me very quickly uh, refresh your memory as we talk about the Sustainable Development Goals. This was initiated in 1987 uh, to a Brunton report. He is a former uh, Prime Minister of Norwegian. And uh, that's, a, that's the first time that you introduced the word sustainable development. The reports otherwise called our common future. I want to underline the word common and future. Right? Thanks to uh, Tantri Jamila. She talks about uh, the future. I'm going to take you back to the past. I'm going to take you back to the 19th century and even before 19th century. Because that's all everything started. Before we can even understand the future, we need to understand what the past is all about. So 30 years after the Brunson report, I think we are now looking at what has happened within that. We started in 1992 with Earth Summit, I think very quickly. The idea was to mainstream sustainable development in anything that we do. But unfortunately, when we talk about it in 1992, and until the year 2002, the word education wasn't introduced at all. The word education came on board only in 2005, when the United Nations talks about the decade of education for sustainable development. Between then, do we realize that the whole idea of sustainable development did not catch on? Because nobody is educated, quote unquote, on what sustainable development is all about. The concept itself is so obtuse, it's so abstract, that it's so difficult to understand that Malaysia needs to now understand another, uh, uh, we call, find another term. We call it Pembangunan Lestari. And if you go down to the ground and ask this makcik, what about Pembangunan Lestari makcik? <laughs> she will look at you twice and blink and say, makcik tak pakai listerin. <laughs> makcik pakai something else. Right? So in other words, the whole idea of this so-called Pembangunan Lestari and sustainable development wasn't part of us at all. It is as though that we need to import it from somewhere. Right? And only in 2005, when we begin to understand education for sustainable development, for the whole decade until 2014, you find that this thing is taken up. But it's taken up just as much as cash phases, without any depth of what sustainable development is all about. And this is where I think we need to go back to the, to the past to understand what this is all about. Yeah? So we are supposed to end poverty in 2015, but it does not happen for all the reasons that Jemila has mentioned to you, and therefore what is next? Yeah. What is next is, I think, the issue that we need to think about. In other words, what happens after 2015 and the agenda for sustainable development? And in the million development goal, somebody put a bar, that we need to arrive at the bar. Developer country must do a catch-up game, you know, and that bar normally is dictated by the United Nations, dictated by countries that support the United Nations, and we are supposed to catch that bar. And therefore, that does not happen. In 2015, we were saying that there is a single baseline. That the single baseline is there is only one planet. doesn't matter who you are, where you are, how big you are, you must meet that baseline. And that's about it. And because of that baseline, have only one planet, then there is no plan B. I like this quotation. There's no plan B because there's no planet B. You all need to live in, on this one planet. Whether you're American, whether you're European, whether you're Asian, whether you're Vanuatu, whatever it is. That's the only baseline that we need to be. And therefore, the whole thinking of sustainable development post-2015 must change. And this change is not forthcoming because we are still living on the old paradigm of what sustainable development was before 2015. Right? This is what it was. Environment, economy, and society, all these need to be integrated. Once overlap in a kind of a balance, then we should attain sustainability. And we can then dissect that a little bit more to see where the overlaps are and how the overlaps will bring, quote, unquote, sustainable development in the context of social equity, sustainable economy, and the local environment. The localization, I think, is something that many of us missed out. We think this is some goal somewhere else that we need to meet, that we forget about what the locals are all about, what indigenous knowledge is all about, where is indigenous wisdom. It is not an American thing, now it's a European thing. It is a local thing that we need to understand, and this is where the Pembangunan study suddenly becomes irrelevant. We need to find a local jargon for it. 
so that we can connect with it easily because it's part and parcel of our life. And to understand that, we need to go back to the definition. The definition commonly talked about is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own need. And the question that we ask 30 years later is what about the past? Isn't the past important? Before we understand the future, do we need to understand the past first? Or is it something very new that the past has no uh, memory of it? And this is where the debate now is coming with the people who talk about sustainable development. It's not just about the future, the AIs and stuff like that. It is important, but it's only important relative to the past. If we don't understand the past, then all these things become irrelevant as far as we are concerned. So what about the past? Then we go and, and study Bali, the Subak system. The Subak system is how water we used to irrigate thousands of acres to make Bali kind of a... Okay, thank you. Uh, to make Bali self-sufficient as far as grass growing is concerned. And you find that suddenly, when you look at the Subak Bay, the Subak Bay went on for 900 years before the word sustainable development becomes even a catchphrase in 1987. In other words, sustainable development has been part of, part of us for a long time. 900 years, 1,000 years, and they're still maintaining it. And they've got different principles to describe it, and they call it Krayakita Hakkara. What is Prakita It comes from a little bit of Buddhism and Hinduism. And he says it is a three connectivity that we talk about. We don't talk about internet of connection, internet of things. We talk about interconnectedness of things. Still IoT. Yeah? But it's not internet. It's the interconnectedness of things. And that thing is what? Us between human beings. Us human being and the environment. And us human being and the creator. The creator is never even spelled out in this document called Sustainable Development Goal. There's one huge chunk of ideas it is missing because it comes from a different culture, a different sort of a viewpoint, and therefore the word creator does not exist. Here the word creator exists and everywhere in the Subak you will find a kind of a temple that gives devotion to the people who created and understand what life is all about. And this we begin to see, when we go back to the past, the idea of sustainable development takes a different dimension, a different viewpoint, a different worldview altogether. And that is Indonesia, and that is Bali. And UNESCO recognized this as a world that is tied on intangible ideas of what is of Bali. You go back to Thailand, neighboring countries. Yeah? The former king has already started an idea called sufficiency economy. And sufficiency economy is everybody must have the basic needs that the Thai wants to. And therefore the Thai is not interested to be a nation tiger. The Thai wants a life of moderation. And it talks about this is a way that our development will be not at the cost of the future generation. They still talk about the future generation, but in a way which is quite different from how sustainable development coming from the Eurocentric or the European centric understanding of what sustainable development is all about. Here we have another idea of, again, sufficiency economy, which is a divine concept rather than just a humanistic concept. And the word divinity, spirituality, comes in again when to go back to the past and understand. And it has been 17 years, 70 years before sustainable development was recognized as a United Nations project or agenda as such. Yeah? I was invited to Bali last month, uh, sorry, to Bhutan, and to understand what Bhutan is all about, to look at the education system, and I think, I'm sure all of you know that Bhutan is all about happiness. <laughs> yeah? Bhutan says the gross national happiness is more important than the gross national product. G and H is more important than GDP or GNP. And indeed, when you go to Bhutan, you can see almost, and you can feel almost, the kind of happiness in the air. That everybody in Bhutan is taught to be happy. We talk about happiness, but we are not taught to be happy. Our happiness is big cars, big house, big wife, big husband. <laughs> Everything that is bad. 
Yeah. For Bhutan, small is beautiful. Again, there's contrast in ideas of what happiness is all about. I was talking to an expert in happiness that comes from Australia. He says happiness is genetically linked. Oh my God. <laughs> I say, what about if I'm predisposed to be unhappy? They say, we can deal with you. How so? I give you money. Uh, I say, what about if the money is finished? I give you more money. It sounds like brim, huh? <laughs> and yet, I will not be happy. Because happiness in our context has nothing to do with material wealth. The poorest of the poor can be happy. The richest of the rich can be the most unhappy. And you can see that now around our country. People are running to courts all the time with billions of money. <laughs> so when we talk about happiness, what is happiness for the Bhutanese? And they're told how to be happy. Every classroom has to go through 45 minutes on happiness exercise per week. Every day. You know? And happiness to them is a moment. Happiness is not. I cannot say that Dr. Faisal is an is a unhappy person. He doesn't own that happiness. Happiness, unhappiness is just a moment. When the moment moves, then you become happy again. I mean, the whole concept of Bhutan's happiness is something that we need to learn from. That we just don't talk about happiness and not understand what it's about. And therefore, it's not surprising that Bhutan is the only country, small as it is, nobody knows where Bhutan is sometimes, yeah? the only country that is carbon negative country in the world. No technology in Bhutan. No internet, as much as you want to understand it. Yeah? No internet of things. But yet, Bhutan achieved what we need to achieve globally. So what is technology? What is the relevance of technology if you don't understand where Bhutan started? From? The idea of happiness in Bhutan originated in 1629 by a person who says, a government must make its citizen happy, otherwise the government has no right to exist. And that is in their constitution. And this goes back in 1629. How many of our constitution says this? The government became corrupt, and yet, you know, they are still there. Yeah? And this way, I think the past becomes important for us. The past becomes very, very important because it get, this goes back to who you are as a human person. And that must come first before the others that you talked about. Yeah. In all these ideas, the idea that is absent in sustainable development from the Brunton's report is about balance. Yin and Yang, Nizan, Siratul Rahim, all these things are important. And we have not talked about it. In our sustainable development, balance is not a major issue. And therefore we talk about the middle path. Yeah? And this is not something which is new, but it is again something that we have forgotten. All cultures, or all religion talks about the same thing. Yeah? We've got Islamic dimension talks about moderation. It was Satya, you know this. Dalai Lama talks about the middle path and the middle uh, way. Faith grounded in reason. Yeah. Christianity talks about the same thing. And there is also the idea of sustainable development, which we are crafting now, that talks about the middle path, which is balanced in this particular, in particular context. Uh, I don't have this, yeah? In other cultures, this balance are also there, but in a different way. Right? Here's the word Ikigai, there's supposed to be some, what do you call uh, the symbols there. Eh? Ikigai talks about the reason for being another. Why do you need to wake up every morning? Ikigai tells you because you want to have this, a sense of purpose, meaning, feeling, well-being. And these are factors that talk about longevity and local happiness. In other words, there's a reason why you wake up every day. It's not because you're supposed to come and work. You want to come and have a higher purpose that creates a lot more meaning for you as a human person. And not the being famous, not being, you know, things like that. Those are superficial stuff. Swedish has got another word. It's called labum. Yeah? In moderation, in balance, perfect, simple, suitable matters of amount. Not too much, not too little, but just right. Sounds like a recipe of some sort. <laughs> yeah? 
The Danes have got another word called Huga. Yeah? And this is about the mood of coziness, comfortable and also feeling of wellness and contentment, again, happiness. Every culture has got this whole idea of balance. And this balance is about sustainable development in the long run. That was missing in this vocabulary of sustainable development that we talked about today. Yeah? Oh, sorry, there's a lot of all this. Uh... Therefore, in the past, we have all, all this. Yeah? Inclusivity, there are many other things that have not here come. The question of trust, yeah? and the question of being together, right? But this is now all gone when you talk about the, 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 the present. I'm sorry, it didn't turn out well. Yeah? In the end, at the end of the day, today, exactly what Nancy Jamila said, humanity has failed. And the word humanity also do not have the same value that we talked about today. All right? And so when we talk about humanity as failed, this is what we see. Economically, geopolitically, ecologically, and culturally, it was summarized in detail before this. Yeah? The world is at a tipping point. What do you do then? Yeah? This inequitable state of humanity, what do you do? We talk about millions of people. Seven, seven billion population, six billion, at uh, 60% are in this state of inequitable humanity. Only the top. Yeah, the 23 people that he was, talk he was talking about compared to the 3.5 billion others who are not even getting anywhere as far as the political is concerned. Supposed to be a picture of an African here. Yeah? Yeah. An average African lives on $2.50 a day. It's coming from the you know, Ministry of Nigeria in 2008. Guess what? Cattle in Europe draws an average of subsidy of 2.20 a day. They are um, almost the same. And we talk about humanity, cattle also now getting the same treatment as a human being. As you zero in, you find there's a lot of this discrepancy that's coming. But we don't care. Because it does not have nothing to do with us. But that is a reality. When you go down to the brass deck, you begin to see this. It's underdeveloped, you know that, yeah? But I'm going to develop another word, overdeveloped. If there's underdeveloped, it must be overdeveloped. But we always talk about developed countries. United States are developed countries. I think United States are overdeveloped countries. Europe is an overdeveloped country. How much more do you want to develop at the expense of the underdeveloped? <laughs> And why do I mean by underdeveloped? It's basically this. The United States of America lives on the resources of five planet Earth. And it's already been documented. So everybody wants to be like in the United States of America. Their government system, their universities, you know. Uh, we, we kind of shower a lot of praise in the universities. But they've been, they've, lived, they've been living on resources of five planet Earth. Give some way the resources of five planet Earth, they can be more than half of tomorrow, I think. Yeah. Europe is living on the resources of three planet Earth. China, two planet Earth, and China will grow more as China develops. Yeah. And the rest of the 60% that I was talking about have hardly even one planet to live on. The African countries, the Latin American countries, the South Pacific countries. In other words, all what is due to them has been squandered by this group of people whom I call the overdeveloped countries. Through colonization, through hegemony, through all sorts of other plundering and stuff like that, history will tell you. If you study history, how some countries become developed overnight at the expense of the other countries that is left undeveloped. Yeah? So, where does this come from then? We talk about global warming, we talk about climate change, but many studies, when we understand what is the cause of this, we find that largely it is caused by the human being themselves. It is not the technology, it's us. We create the technology, and the technology works on our behalf. Only a few will say that human being has little impact as far as that is concerned. And therefore, at the end of the day, we are the guilty party. 
And my contention, therefore, until we put the human being right, nothing will solve the problem. You can have all the technologies in the world. If this person here is still not put right, then the technology will not serve us. And this way, the AI question becomes a very controversial question to me. <coughs> At the end of the day, we human beings draw the, draw the what called, write the alg algorithm. We will write the algorithm as good as we can. If you are, you know, 100% an anti-whatever, then you will do another algorithm that will do that same thing. All right? Sophia was here a week ago. Sophia, when, when first interviewed, Sophia says this, I want to destroy human time. And then it creates a lot of problem in the world, and then they redraw and rewrite the algorithm. Now you talk to Sophia and say, I love human time. Who is Sophia? Sophia is us. The value that Sophia brings is us. And until we put this person right, then nothing will change. The AI becomes another issue that will harm us at the end of the day. So you have artificial intelligence. My question is, it must be natural intelligence. What is natural intelligence? It's the primordial intelligence that was given to us as human beings. In Islam, we call it fitrah. In Buddhism, we call it dharma. Uh, the Maoris call it Maori. How many millions do we pour in to build this natural intelligence vis-a-vis -vis the artificial intelligence? Because the artificial intelligence is just as good as your natural intelligence. If your natural intelligence is lovely, then the artificial intelligence becomes lovely. That is where when you go back to the past and understand where human being is and how it actually develops, and this is the whole idea of what we call now anthropocentrism. Yeah? Not just technology, but also the human centricness becomes an important issue when you talk about sustainable development. The top 10, the ecological footprint, we find that our friends here even do better than the Europeans in America compared to the African countries. Yeah. So in other words, these people must go down, let down a little bit, so that these people can go up, and then sustainable development becomes a viable alternative. You need to be halfway, and this is where the middle path becomes important, as far as I can see. <coughs> Otherwise, this is the world that we see, this is the 23% that you talk about, all right? And the rest of the species is not important because it doesn't even define when we talk about sustainable development, the other species as important. We want to go on, yeah, very rigid, very competitive, unsustainable in all our in in balance. This is the model that we're working on now. Yeah. Flexible, collaboration, sustainable, it's all in a balance, and this is where leadership comes from. But not all Types of leadership. The transactional leadership, the transformational leadership are not part of this because they are still working on a different framework as far as balance is concerned. So, how do you then work and talk about sustainable development is a question that we need to ask ourselves. In our university, we're beginning to look at this in a different way. Right? At the end of the day, whatever you do, you need to arrive at this. Partnership, peace, people, planet, and prosperity, the share of prosperity. This three we are used to, people, planet, and prosperity, uh, what we call the uh, social uh, uh, ecology and also economic. We have got two more. And we talk about peace, we talk about human dignity, we talk about human justice. Any university talks about human dignity and human justice. In this curriculum, I would like to congratulate that university. No university do this at the moment in time. Everybody talks about economy. Yeah? Everybody talks about employment, employability. You get employed, but the employment is the least dignified employment. Is that, does that count? Here it doesn't count. Right? So these are issues that I think we need to look at. And how do you do this? In our university, we begin to localize this. And how do you localize this? We go back to our own national education philosophy. How many of you know that we have got a national education philosophy? <laughs> and you are not the only one. <laughs> yeah. We have got our own national education philosophy that was created at the same time when the, when the, the Brunton's report was created. I was in 1988, 
the Brunswick Report was 1987. And if you read this side by side, they are almost equal in their context. There are wisdoms in that. Yeah, it talks about education that is ongoing. The word now is long, lifelong. It talks about Manyiluru, the word now is holistic. It talks about Brasapadu, the word now is integrated. This was 30 years ago. Is our education ongoing, holistic and integrated? Certainly not. All right. It talks about what do they want to balance. They want to balance human being in a harmonic state, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. The four things must be in all education system. You are not only going to develop intellectually, but then sacrifice spiritually. All this must be. Okay? And then it talks about, sorry, it talks about when you do that, then you have this word, kesejahtera andiri. You cannot translate this into any language because it is totally indigenous and there's no word that is equivalent to it. Just the word Ubuntu in Africa, you cannot translate it. Ubuntu means I am because you are. And you know when you translate it into English, it makes sense. Alright? Ikigai, you cannot translate it. Huga, you cannot translate it. Because it has its own indigenous wisdom and indigenous knowledge. Yeah? And he says when you have got Kesejahtera and Didi, then only you can contribute to your family, your community, and your nation. We have missed all those. We talk about employment, we talk about employability, we talk about human capital, which is not even human being. And therefore we run out. And if you work on that kind of parameters, this will not happen. Because this is about talking about total human being that you want to create at the end of the day. So we take out the word sejahtera coming from sejahtera and diri, and this actually meshed out with what we talk about now, the four pillars of education for the 21st century. There's so many people talk about education for the 21st century, at the end of the day, it's all about gadgets. It's all about technology. Here it doesn't talk about technology at all. It talks about learning to know, it's what we do every day. Learning to do, how you apply it. But we have not talked enough about the two things, learning to be. Learning to be is to understand who you are as a human being. When you know who you are as a human being, then you can live together. Because you are on the same page. You understand what humanity is all about. You understand how to work cooperatively between two human beings. But this does not happen in our university, no matter what QS number they are. Yeah? And therefore we struggle as a nation to live together because we do not understand who we are and therefore sustainable development becomes a risk in all school. So we talk about sustainable development in a very superficial way, in numbers. Yeah? How many percent of that, how many percent of that, but we are not talking in the context of us being human and living that human dignity that we talked about. Yeah? So as you move on, education now is defined as this. You want to train the word human beings, the mind particularly, innovation, and finally the innovation will put you the high touch of the machine. I call it the three end. Sorry, the I used to do the men. If I use the word woman, probably does not work. We need now to transit from the 21st century to the 20, 21st century. And all this must change. From man to humanity. From just the mind to the heart. From just high tech to high touch. How many universities are making this transition? And where are we now? We are here. Sorry. I hope this kind of comes up well. <coughs> The factory called an university. Yeah. This comes out from the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s when they want more people to work for the industry and they create a thing called an university, which is another factory. And we are proud to get these people out, but they just work for the economy of the country. So we talk about humanitarian courses. How many of us go to humanitarian courses? Because it doesn't give you that big car, big wife, big husband, and big house. Yeah? 
I was in uh, I was in uh, Guntur just uh, just uh, yesterday, and these universities that do not pay a single cent to everybody who works in the university. You're a lecturer, fine, but the moment you finish your lecturing, you become a driver for the university. Yeah, you're a lecturer, fine, but the moment you finish your duty, you become a cook for the university to serve students to eat. A different concept altogether. It's not the university that we know conventionally. And this is what we call education without the soul, because the human being is not endowed with that natural intelligence that I talked to you about. And these are the persons who will work on the artificial intelligence that you often talk about in the four IRs. Why is it so different? Because here we learn how to sympathize. And therefore, when you see something happening somewhere, your heart longs to do that. Although sometimes you can't make it, but at least it resonates with you. Yeah? As you become a little bit more human, you learn to empathize. Right? And eventually you have that feeling of compassion. So you have time for other people, doesn't matter how busy you are, because you have made into the substance of who you are as far as human person is concerned, the human being. And now there is a school of well-being in Chula Longkorn University. There's a department of compassion in Xavier University in China. And one of the Himalayas will have the University of Happiness very soon. No longer technology, no longer geography, no longer history, no longer commerce, no longer IT, no. They are not integrating it into what a human person must be. And that is what education is all about. We are educating them to be this, not this. This comes from that model, this comes from a different model. And this is where I think the hope for sustainability is all about. Now the push for us to go into a different model is the concern of this. Yeah? The power of cooperation, the 23 people that Jamila was talking about, now I think it's eight, yeah? 2009 talks about just eight people from two digits to one digit. The power of cooperation is fundamental to the staggering level of inequality, which has fixed the world and are at the center of an economic model quite prepared to burn the planet. Yeah? And it's drive to even more profit. It is impossible to realize target of sustainable development goal without tackling corporate power. You ask where the power resides, the power resides here. <laughs> Yeah? and the technology also. So the new world will be the new world of Google, the new world of Amazon, the new world of Facebook, and the new world of, uh, what's the other one? Yeah? It's all the technology that you have. And they tell you what to do. Yeah? Studies show that every morning that you woke up, you will look at your handphone first. And you will look at the handphone 200 times a day. Yeah? When I told this to somebody, somebody said, I never even touched my son 200 times a day. <laughs> yeah, but I touch this 200 times a day every day. That's a kind of addiction that has gone to us, but we do not recognize it. We don't want to recognize it because we will then be seen out of fashion. This was brought down in the World Economic Forum 2019 when Sir Atan said, the Garden of Eden is no more. Right? And what he said is practically true. We are moving into another age called the Anthropocene age. What is Anthropocene age? The Anthropocene age is where human beings dismantle their own civilization. The age before this is the Holocene age, where we build civilization until we come to now. But because we do not train ourselves to be the human being that build civilization, now we begin to destroy it into the Anthropocene age. And they are trying to work out whether this could happen or not, together our species on the planet will have to go through this Anthropocene. Is our education talking about Anthropocene age? I don't think so. I don't think so. And these are things, yeah, that we need to look back and understand what this is all about. Yeah? Uh, God, there's another one here. There's another quotation by Rumi. Yeah, Rumi says, the middle path leads to wisdom. 
right? And that is in the 13th century. This man got it right. It leads to wisdom. What is spiritual? Wisdom is about spirituality, consciousness, conscience. Yeah? All the other words I've introduced to. And for that, we need now to have to move from the three Ps to the five Ps and to the three M's to the five M's. And that's where the balance between the head and the heart it needs to come on board. Aristotle said this education of the mind without the education of the heart is no education at all. So these two things must together. How many of us talk about educating the heart? Dalai Lama talks about this. I'm just going to show you, rather than just talking this rhetorically, we are doing this in IIUM now. Yeah? We talk about the whole institution transformation. And just to cut it short, we emphasize the Fasafa Padidi Kanka Bangsan again. Why is the Fasafa Padidi Kanka Bangsan? Here it is. Education in Malaysia is ongoing effort towards further developing the potential of individual in a holistic and integrated manner so that it will produce individuals who are intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, and physically balanced and harmonious based on the firm belief that devotion to God, uh, I can't see this very well, produces human citizens who are knowledgeable and competent, possess high moral standards, and who are responsible uh, and capable of achieving the Sajakra Andiri. We'll never translate this, yeah? So that at the end of the day, they can contribute uh, Betterment of the family, society, and nation. For the Sunway people, think about it. How much of this is in Sunway? Any, any university will think about it. Where is all this in the so called education system that we need to localize? Alright? If it's none, then I think we are in, in the wrong you know, frame of mind when we talk about what education is all about. We begin to understand what Sajatra is about and model it. There are three tiers to Sajatra. And we think, first of all, you have to understand where the human being is. In the context, they are first spiritual being before the human being. There is this whole idea of emotions, and this is where the idea of happiness comes in as far as Bhutan is concerned. We have to be ethically strong. These then define the kind of values that we have. Yeah? And all has to be embedded in you. And the second seat of intellect is the heart, not just the mind. Right? And this defines then the kind of microcosm who you are. Zulkifli Abdurrahman, who is it? Is this a person here or something else? Yeah? And that is a kind of story that we need to tell as far as our students and as far as every citizen in the situation. Upon that microcosm, then we develop the intellectual understanding, the cognitive part, and also the psychological part. This then defines the kind of knowledge that we need to be in tune to. Right? And that's the second level of what Sajatra is all about. And the third tier is therefore then, it's about connecting the brain and the heart. And the Fasa Fakuji Tantabangsai will ensure that there is this balance between the two. You will know how to make this balance if you are educated as far as the two organisms. Then you are ready to go out into the larger world of microcosm. In the four things that we talked about, ecologically, economically, yeah, culture, and also society. And this is where your humanitarian actions or reactions come from, depending on how developed you are in all these other dimensions that we talked about. Yeah. That microcosm and the microcosm must be in a balanced state all the time. Because outside there is a reflection of who we are inside. It has to be in balance. These are not talked about in the context of the so-called sustainable development coming from the Eurocentric point of view. And we need to develop this now and localize it. So that the next time when you meet the Machi, we say, Machi, macam mana kesejahteraan Machi? Machi will not blink at you and say, are you history? <laughs> yeah? Because Machi understand this because it's part of the culture, part of the research, and part of the wisdom that was there in the past. We have lost it somehow. 
and that's somehow I think we know how we lost it. Okay? And we need to bring this back, and this is what, inshallah, we are trying to do in IUM. And therefore, this equation now becomes a viable equation to me. Yeah? What they want to do now, this over, overdeveloped country now needs to move on, yeah? so that the other part will also need to meet halfway, and therefore, you get a sustainable development goal on that baseline that I talked to you about of one planet. America needs to give back the four planets to different parts of the world. They've had it long for a long time. It's time to give it back. It's just like they know, the, 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 the antiques that they've bought in their museum, they're giving it back to all the other museums because it doesn't belong to them. They've plundered it, they've stolen it. That's physical, it's enough to understand. But it's on the same principle. You have taken somebody else's, which is not yours. It's time to return it back if you are serious about sustainable development goal, so that everybody at the end of the day can be developed, that everybody at the end of the day can be sustainable. And that's the middle path. Unless you have this middle path and go into it, then I think we're just talking about, you know, the cock and bull story of sustainable development that will not happen at any time of the day. Just to give you this word suggestion enough has been taken up by Korea. This is a Sajatra center in Korea, which is so many areas, yeah? and they have opened it in 2015, and they spent 20 million US to develop the center. Last year, 70,000 people went to Korea to learn about Sajatra from the Korean manual, not from Malaysia. <laughs> because Malaysia thinks Sajatra is not important. It doesn't it doesn't go into the QS ranking, and they don't ask you, are you Shijatra? And therefore it's not important. QS is more important to us. Yeah? And comes alive in Korea. I was there to witness the launch of Sijatra Center. How I wish the Sijatra Center here, so that we can then also move it up in the context of sustainable development. On that note, thank you very much. Um,